so these are all real life examples of ransomware that have been anonymized and the, the data has been sanitized. So it's not exposing any proprietary information or personal information. And we'll get into a little bit later about how we obtain some of this information. But you can see, for example, this is the Avdon ransomware group. And it looks like this was a ransomware in December, 2021. So the ransomware threat actor solicits the, the payment. And I believe they gave them a test file that was encrypted and a test decryption key to show that it works. And you can see that the victim eventually was able to get it to work and replies that they were willing to pay. And then they later said they found a decryption key, a universal decryption on GitHub. It's funny that they dropped the price right here, but then they, they mentioned that they released a patch for that decryptor. So this brings up an interesting point, similar to regular software that has vulnerabilities, ransomware can have vulnerabilities too. And commonly security researchers will reverse engineer the ransomware to find some sort of vulnerability and figure out a way to decrypt it without having to pay. And so then you can see that they, they talk a little bit at the end and they're saying that the, the victim is saying that it was too expensive and that they're having financial troubles and are un unable to pay. And so then the ransomware threat actor says that they will release all the files that they had previously stolen before they encrypted the files. They'll start releasing them on their blog. And so this is a double extortion tactic, which became started becoming the de facto standard 2020, 2021, and still goes on to this day. And so then they kind of go back and forth a little bit. And they're one thing that they have no assurance that they can decrypt it, even if they, they pay the ransom. They also bring up that another company had been hit by this ransomware and they paid. And then the ransomware threat actors hit them again. And eventually they, they actually do respond to that question saying that they had done this to other companies before and that they were all able to unencrypt it. What's funny here is that they also tell them that they will give them the information about how they were able to access the systems and what vulnerabilities they were exploiting. It's almost like they're giving them a pen test report after hacking into their systems. And so let's look at a couple of higher profile examples. So let's jump into dark side. This is a, this is a pretty big high profile ransom where they were asking for $2 million. This probably made the news somewhere. Again, can't tell who it is. And so Darkseid basically asks, are they ready to start talking? And the victim immediately asks for more time and basically saying that they're having trouble getting the Bitcoin that quickly. Darkseid says there's enough time, basically pushes back. And so they have a timer on the ransom note that basically says if they don't pay by this date, this time that they will start leaking information in the dark web or not ever give them an encryption key. And so they keep asking for more time and dark side replies saying that they basically need to give them something in return for more time, like a higher payment. So it looks like these guys are definitely better negotiators than the first one we looked at. And here's where it gets interesting. So the victim says that they don't have the liquidity to pay that quickly, but it looks like dark side had stolen all their accounting files and basically says that they looked at the files and see that they do have the liquidity. Here's where it gets kind of funny. So it looks like Darkseid started ghosting them. So they, they started typing some crazy stuff. And remember, this is a $2 million negotiation. And someone's putting stuff like this and stuff like this. Which I'm going to guess this was the IT admin. And it doesn't look like there was a professional negotiator on this one. Here's another interesting one. Let's go to Conti. So you see this one, the victim makes contact and they kind of give some of the instructions. Again, they offer a security report, basically how they were initially breached, what vulnerabilities they had, in addition to the decryption tool, obviously. In this case, they have support. So a lot of these larger ransomware organizations, they have support similar to, they have a support team similar to what a typical software company would have in the US, which is just kind of bizarre when you think about it. And then you can see they basically, again, trying to reinforce the seriousness of the situation, saying that they're going to dump their information on the web, on their dark website, and that they're going to face much fines and things. And then, so this has been now four days and they, the victim hasn't replied. So then they say that, so they basically say that they're going to start publishing stuff on their blog, which is on their dark website. So that they do that. And this is when the victim notices and says, okay, like we noticed, we do not want, what, we don't know if this continued to happen, what could they do to stop it? And then again, they go back to pay the ransom. And so it's important to mention this one is a lot more professional of a negotiator, you can see. And so a lot of times with the larger ransoms, the cyber insurance will send out a ransomware 
negotiator as well as kind of a data breach coach. And so this is a professional negotiation. You can see he's merely asking for more time um, and saying, you know, that they're not profit, they don't have a lot much money. Then what's funny is Conti immediately offers a, a discount of 10 Bitcoin. So they drop it. And so the victim says that they'll meet with the upper management and talk about it. Um, and they want to get some statistics and information about you know, what's been compromised. Again, they're trying to get more information. This is a definitely a professional negotiator. Um, and they give a reason why they say this would help get it approved. So the ransomware threat actors give them some metrics on how much they've gotten in 90 servers and 500 desktops. And then basically says, hurry up or they're going to raise the price again. And again, they threatened to publish information online. And what's important to mention, when they publish the information online, they don't do it all at once. They do it very slowly over the course of months to kind of prolong the pain and increase the chances that the company will pay the ransom. Now they're saying that they want to get a sample of the stolen data. Again, this is a negotiator buying more time and also getting more information. And with a ransom this big, it's also possible if the FBI is involved and they're trying to get information for a potential takedown operation. So they may be buying time and getting information to avoid paying the ransom altogether in the case that the FBI is able to get these guys and get into their infrastructure, compromise it and take it down, which we did see that happen with Darkseid and a lot of ransomware groups after high profile breaches. So then they give them the information here. You can see they give them samples and files that they had stolen. Again, they, they threaten them, they release the data. So then the victim says, can you prove that you have that much data that's ours? So he gives a little sample, but how do we know you have all that data? And then the ransomware support basically says that normally this is enough for most people. And then they say basically that they host everything in the cloud, which is funny, just like a regular software company, they have cloud infrastructure. And then, so they ask for, so they ask for a screenshot here. Again, this may be them trying to get information for the FBI for a takedown operation. This is, this is clearly a professional negotiator and they say they're not going to give a screenshot. So now it's getting to the point they say they have the Bitcoin to transfer. Again, try to get more information, try to get the size of it. They're taking like how many gigabytes. And this, is, this is a good negotiator. And they also bring up that the current price of Bitcoin had changed. And then eventually you go down a little bit. They offer another discount of five Bitcoin and they ask for a little more time. And then they say the most they can afford is 14 Bitcoin. And then again, they're asking for a sample file showing like social security numbers that they had stolen. And this is what, so they actually do, they give, well, this is a driver's license, which doesn't have social security, but they give a couple other PDFs to show examples. And so they're slowly gaining more information in the negotiation and they keep talking. So at this point, this has been almost from the beginning. You see now it's November 8th and this started in mid October. So it's been a good month since this thing started. And so again, they kind of negotiate a little bit and they say that the revenue is pretty low. They don't have enough money for it. In this case, they had stolen financial records, or this is public records in this case. So they say basically revenues 76, I don't know if it's 2KK on here. I don't know if that's $76,000 or 76, 760,000, something like that. But they basically agree the revenue is low and they offer more of a discount. So at this point you can see. So now that they've dropped it to 39 Bitcoin from the initial price of 69 Bitcoin. So they've gotten almost, they've almost cut it in half now. And then they also talk a little bit about, they start negotiating and say, basically we'll accept 15 Bitcoin. We won't get decrypted for you, but we won't post it. We won't post the data on the dark web. And then they brought up now that, you know, they have the initial Bitcoin approved. Now it's gotten much more expensive and trying to get even more discount. And so you see, this is a very good negotiator. He keeps pushing it down and they basically say it's not our fault. And this is kind of where it ends. Now we'll do one more, which I think that there's an interesting one of Revil, which was another notorious ransomware threat actor that did the high profile breaches. And so this negotiator seems to like to write long communication. They basically talk you know, about situation of their company, uh, it's been catastrophic with COVID and everything going on. A lot of people are unemployed and they're saying, how could they possibly pay $7.5 million? So this is, this is another big high profile case. And they say they're basically dump passwords, emails, phone numbers, as well as client info, non-disclosure non agreements, payment information, and technical specifications of the product, which here's where it gets interesting because he basically replies then and says, we don't really have any proprietary information. We're a commodities trading company and they don't care about the NDAs and some of the passwords and things. So you can see right here, it says, 
client is not interested, if you guys do the email dump or NDAs or whatever you have in your hands, the value of it you guys have is irrelevant to my client. The client sells commodities. So there's no industrial secret to be protected. This is one of the world's largest manufacturing of blank. Your client has spent some millions of dollars on recovery software and hardware for it. So again, Revol's very good at negotiating too. They've looked through a lot of these documents and are using this information against them in the negotiation process, but they do drop the price. So it's important to mention this one is very recent. This is a month ago that this happened. And so this is only a few days into the negotiation. They've dropped it quite a bit. They've dropped it to $5 million from the initial $7.5 million. The victim then sends the payment, you can see, in Monero. This was Monero, not, not Bitcoin, because what, what happened recently is it like Bitcoin tracking and blockchain analysis has become a lot more prevalent. So they'll use more anonymous currencies like Monero. These big breaches, there's always the chance that the FBI does a takedown operation and seizes the Bitcoin like we saw at the Colonial Pipeline. So there is some, some effect that law enforcement is having on these guys. They're not operating with complete impunity. And you can see that they, they give instructions now on how to, after they pay, they give instructions how to use a decryption key. Talk about if you turn off your antivirus and all this stuff. And so it's also important to note, like when you see this, they talk about this, it's not a straight just enter the key and everything's back. It's generally a process and it requires some work from the IT team to, to get this thing going. They actually do provide support after they, they pay the ransom and help them decrypt their stuff. So it looks like in this case, Credential compromise was how the, in the Citrix server was how they initially got access. They basically ask them, do they buy it on the dark web or they get it another way? And they say it's important to understand and prevent future attacks from other ransomware gangs. And they said, yeah. And it's funny here. So they actually do acknowledge they bought it off the dark web. Um, basically said somebody, if one of your clients was affected, infected, it wasn't us. That's why you guys should use two-factor authentication on your Citrix server. So you can see this is a pretty variable thing from how one ransomware group operates to the other ones. It's also very variable how the negotiation, how the negotiations go, even with professional negotiators as well. So you're probably wondering where they get all this information. So there's a company called casual tech where basically it admins and people who have been victims of ransomware can basically send them copies of the ransomware negotiation with I assume they're probably, I didn't read into this this much, but I assume that they're probably sanitizing it and anonymizing it before they send it to this company. And then they basically put everything and normalize everything into a JSON file. And you can see this thing gets updated pretty regularly. Like we just looked at one that was a month old. So this is super cool. They're basically doing this to try to spread awareness of kind of what these ransomware negotiations look like. 